Tassam Namo Tassa Bagot uh, that's good too, yes. <laughs> Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, I think we can continue. So I'm asking for questions first tonight. Okay. So if anybody has, you know, questions, Sarma wants to jump in. That's good. Yes, correct. Okay, so what I want to know is what is what is happening in your blocking you in your meditation? What is it? What's happening? Not in the meditation. I am asking a question on this vaccine. It ah. is coming it, it, when it, when I watch in the meditation. It is coming like a a force a effect. It is coming like a big force. And when I am doing meditation after some time, the force slows down and it becomes white uh, color, transparent color, metta, nimitta. Yeah. And that is how the force is slowing down and uh, afterwards my mind gets diverted towards jhana and I will not speak about this virus or anything. This is what I am observing in the meditation. Can you please explain what is that? Well, anything that anything they put in you, every single bit of <laughs> this is a good one. Every single part they put into the um, vaccine, every one of them has a um, vibration level that you can measure. Yeah. And so this is, they're putting this together. The, the disturbing thing for a lot of people is that they put this together rather fast. This is not a normal kind of vaccine. Nothing that's happened with COVID is really normal. <laughs> Nothing is normal from day one. And how they decided to do these things and put stuff in it, there are all different, you, you can look this up on the internet to see, for instance, if you look, you can find a place where it tells you the ingredients for the COVID and take each one of the things that they tell you they're putting into it and then go in the internet to look up the frequency for that. And the frequencies are all mixed together inside the vaccine. So you're sensitive now because you're meditating so deeply, you are picking up things and because of the level that you're practicing at um, you you are sensing things you're you're very sensitive in your in your brain to what's going on you see and you're feeling it now the one thing about the nimitta is in our practice we go very strictly by the suttas the suttas do not mention the nimitta the way the nimitta is taught with some other types of training other types of training will say, if the nimitta comes, watch the nimitta, stay with the nimitta. Some of them say, if the nimitta comes up, follow the nimitta. And you can even make the nimitta go this way and that way and get larger and smaller. I don't know what they say um, in um, Goenka. I'm not sure what they talk about the nimitta. But the idea that the nimitta was important is not in the suttas at all. And so when we go back to the suttas, we refer to the remarks about, you, you ask the question first, you say to yourself, where am I going? What am I attempting to do? And you know what you're attempting to do. You're attempting to get to cessation and have the experience again, okay? So when we go to, let's see, it's either 43 or 44, just a second, I gotta find it. In the questions and answers is where you get your answer to this uh, because um, there's a description in here that's talking about the signs and this you are going it's more simple to just say it to you instead of finding it. Um, you're attempting to go to a signless place right. Correct, correct. Okay, uh, correct, word, correct word it is used. 
That's right. So cessation is a signless, not non-concept place. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not a realm. It's just an experience. But to have that experience happen, you have to get empty. We're going to talk about that tonight. Okay. okay. Thank you. And um, so the problem is if you, you know how, you know, you've learned from us from practice, you've learned how to train the brain. You understand you're attempting to communicate with the brain in this meditation. Teach yourself how to communicate with it. And you're training it to, for instance, um, in the Brahma Viharas, you're training it to send loving kindness to one person. Then you're training to do the other kind of people. And you want to see why do you do the other kind of people, by the way. Somebody said to me, why do I have to do these other kind of people? Because I'm teaching you how to communicate with your brain. How will you know whether you're communicating with your brain or not? Well, if you were communicating with the first spiritual friend and that person smiled back, let's see if we use 11 other kinds of people, whether those people will smile back too. That's all this is about, really. It's a, it's a, train, it's a game with the brain. It's like a dog trick. Can you do it again? Can you do it again? Can you do it again? That's what it's about. And so... When you're doing that communication, the other thing, you know you're trying to go to a signless state. So it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? When it says that if you want to reach cessation, then you shouldn't pay attention to any signs that come up at all. Make sense? Yeah? Yes. I okay. would like to ask you one question. The okay. signless state, whatever it is, that what uh, white color is coming, is it with my own well, intention all, or without my intention? No, first of all, you're not in a signless state if mm. you have an image. Yes. That's okay. a given. Okay. That signless state is coming. Is it with my intention or not with my intention? It's when your intention lets go and everything leaves. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. After we get mm -hmm. to the questions, we're going to go through this little lesson plan I put together so that you can see how you tie the training all together. You weave the training all together and then what happens is you begin to understand that this practice is systematically teaching your brain to just let go. Let go of what? Go. First of all, let go of anything in the past. Second of all, anything in the future thoughts, right? That means that you're staying right here in, 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 right here in the present time. And as long as you stay right here while you're practicing, this is all that you're doing. So everything that we're telling you, this is what is so interesting that came together all from this text is telling you how to sit, is telling you what to watch, what not to pay attention to, what to do when hindrances and dis distractions come up. Very specifically, he's telling you what to do. And that we'll get to that too, okay? So, but basically when a sign comes up, uh, you might think that you're in the deepest state and nothing's going to come up. But obviously if the nimitta came up, whether it's from the vibrations of the contents of the vaccine or not, is tripping it off. When that comes up, you're not in that deep state. You slipped back and slipped out to have that experience with that sign, get it? So our practice, and this is why it got lost. In my opinion, this is why it got lost. Everything that goes on in India is very concentrated, you know, it's very concentrated. And when they teach you to, to do absorption, you're very pointed and you're concentrated. And this is all tight here. It's all a kind of tightness. You may not believe it's tight or even see it in your face anymore after a while. But when you go home from a retreat, it comes right back. This comes right back, this tightness, all right? And what we're trying to teach you by using the steps of twin, every time that you do the first two steps, you're purifying mind by letting go of the unwholesome. And what did we tell you the unwholesome was? Tension and tightness. And the wholesome is moving towards no tension and tightness. 
So the spot you're trying, you're attempting to reach, I keep saying you are attempting and you are, but when my, the attempting I'm talking about is just the intention, just intention. There is no doing in the intent, in the, um, in the attempting I'm talking about. Does that make sense to you? Because it's very hard to do this with language in heaven. <laughs> you know, uh, now I have a question. How yeah. do we know that what is right and what is wrong? Wrong action. Oh, action. Let go of, let go of, I'm doing it. At the uh, same time, I wanted to have some sort of, uh, because I am not fully in that particular, uh, 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 I am fully aware uh, that uh, it is right or wrong, some sort of doubt comes. Uh, of course, letting go of uh, that is okay. That is the practice in Twim we are following. What is wrong? What is right? How do we come to know? If it Did is a falsehood. Okay, okay, stop, stop. I want you to go back. I wish you were recording what you're saying somehow. <laughs> oh, this is <laughs> recording. So maybe you can go back and listen. Because what you were saying just then is, yeah, I can see with this and I understand this, but what I wanted was, did you hear yourself say that? No. Uh, oh, but what I wanted was, did you remember, do you hear that? <laughs> I mean to say, we state that falsehood is knowingly or unknowingly immoral, something it comes to mind. Let it go off, let it go off, I'm doing. You let it go, relax, smile, and come back. Uh, smile and come back. That, that uh, 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 We have to come to our uh, OYM. Let it go, smile. Object of meditation, I'm coming back. There right. I will get some sort of doubt, whether I'm doing it right or not, right. Something I'm seeing, new thing, new one. That new one is right or wrong. How do we know? That is what the question is. Okay, now, do you hear what doubt is doing to you just there? Do you do you recognize what doubt is doing to you? If you go to- Not doubt, not wait. doubt, whatever is occurring to me. No, listen to me. Please. You said this doubt comes up, that's right. And what does doubt do? Doubt makes you start asking questions and stop doing your meditation. That's exactly what doubt does. And if you go to Upak Kalesa Sutta 128, doubt is the very first one that comes up in the sutta. He says, um, you know, um, let's see, what, what is the condition of what? Okay, he says, they're talking about the light and the vision of forms have disappeared. And then I consider something happened that was strange. So he says, doubt arose in me. And because of the doubt, my concentration fell away. The moment you had doubt and started questioning, you stopped your meditation. Do you understand? Yes. This is the trap that the hindrance sets. It's like a spider web, a beautiful spider web sitting here saying, come to me, come to me. And then as soon as you say, ooh, what is that? You just left. <laughs> left over here the moment you went to go ooh, what is that or ooh, how is that ooh, why is that as soon as you did that you stopped and you fell out of that deeper state and you were involved now with doubt you know, so uh, one minute one minute uh, mataji yeah it's a fear of uh, wrongdoing it is a fear of uh, one some sort of wrongdoing am i attempting like that it comes it is not fully doubt so am what? i doing okay. but let it go off we'll do it Okay, fear is fine. Fear arose in me. And because my fear and con arose, my concentration fell away. Fear is another one. So every one, every word that you can come up and mention is in about, there's nine or 11 of these suttas sitting in the Majima Nikaya. And those, every word you can come up with, it's here. So one of them in the Upat Kalesa, there's 11 of them. Fear arose in me. And I, because the fear of the fear, my concentration fell away, which meant that the moment you questioned it or thought something or asked something in your mind, you left your line of observation. Your collectedness fell away. Uh, and collectedness fell away. Correct. Of forms disappeared. Your light and vision of forms when you're in very deep states is just the darkness and watching to see if a, a vibration might come over and cross in front of you or something like that, or a little light might come like that and go away. That's all. Uh, if a nimitta comes up, nimittas develop, by the way, they don't just appear. Nimittas actually start as a light and then they come up and they're bigger up here. 
But the moment you get interested in it at all, what size is it? Is it changing size? Is it any? And the moment you, you come out of this and say, you know, that happened. And I wonder what that was. You're telling me I stopped and started to wonder. I doubted what I was doing. You have the what, what do you do with doubt? Well, in the end of the sutta, he tells you what he did with everything. He says, when um, I understood that doubt was an imperfection. Why is it an imperfection? It's an imperfection because it takes you off the track of your observation. Get it? No, you got it? Got it. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. It's no Thank more. You. See, we can, <laughs> I did this once for 30 minutes with a student, what we're doing right now. And he kept changing the words and changing the words and changing the words. But every single one he brought up, I could find in the text. And the, that's what's amazing is how completely the Buddha actually gave instructions for the hindrances. That's why I need to take just disappear for like maybe uh, two months to, to do the hindrance book by itself and get it done. Because the hindrance book, I have all this research and I keep trying to finish these other books <laughs> instead of doing the hindrance book. But the hindrance book, Mm -hmm. Mataji, Mataji, yeah. these are all born in the uh, born in the shape of a some state of downfall as a result of doing this particular meditation, and this fear of wrongdoing is there or not? Uh, I am not able to come out and let it go off like that. I am doing it and coming out, and coming to that uh, OIM, uh, object of meditation. This is what happening. But if I uh, if I stand there and look at back, uh, your what is your object in meditation right now? Uh, let us say it is loving kindness right now. No, you're way beyond loving kindness. You've gone hmm. through karuna, through joy, through your inequanimity somewhere. Are you in quiet mind? Correct. What you said is correct. Okay, so <laughs> no. Your object of meditation is observation of quiet mind and nothing quiet. else. Nothing. There's no wish involved here. There's no verbalization. There's nothing. But when I come out, uh, this fear of wrongdoing, it is uh, it arises in the mind that is there. Whether I have seen something, I, I use the word nimitta. Nimitta is a wrong word I know. At the same time, I use it because I will get some sort of uh, correct language from you. That is called signless state, you said. That is the correct thing you are using. using. In the same way, at then and there, the, the fear of uh, am I doing correct or not, what I have seen is correct or not, that, that sort of uh, mind uh, will be there at that mind. When you say fear of wrongdoing, it is doubt. It is doubt I am doing the right thing. Well, what my, my suggestion to you is if you want to review something, write down the steps of the four, four steps of right effort and examine closely for yourself what is happening in the first two steps of right effort. You know, recognize really isn't one of them. Re well, recognize it and release it as the first one when you're talking four steps to recognize it and release it. You recognize you have this going on and this is doubt and you release it. Why is it? Why is this um, that doubt? Also, Why is the first two steps are unwholesome only. Then yes. only I'm coming to wholesome because of the object of meditation. I'm coming to wholesome with a smiling mind. Yes, but you're not letting go of the fear. It, you're letting it come up again and again. So you have to retrain your mind to let go of it and just say never mind to it. I keep I like the term never mind or no, let it. Okay. You all mm -hmm. say you all say traditionally when you say say la vie, let it let it go. It's a uh, uh, mm -hmm. This is life, or this present time is life in French. C'est la vie. Somebody has something to say. <laughs> so, so when you when you say just let it be, okay, mm. that means just let it go and come back to what you know is right. And I'll also tell you this: when by the time you get to by the time. Yeah, by the time you what get time? to quiet mind, you, um, oh, I lost that thought. <laughs> Let's see. By the time you get to quiet mind, hmm, just flew out of my mind. 
there's nothing else going on anywhere. But can you get everything? Okay. Hmm. Uh, tell me, ma. I think the baby's playing with the microphone. Some Nanda, Nanda Kair, please. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. When doubt comes up, it's the very first, um, the very first um, hindrance that he's mentioning in the Upakalesa. There are 11 of them here. There is doubt. And then there is sloth and torpor. And then there is fear, elation, inertia, excess energy, deficiency of energy, longing, perception of diversity, and excessive meditation on forms. All of those are individual pieces. Yours is doubt. You cannot go away from doubt. Doubt is doubt. And when you keep saying, but if this isn't that, that's doubt. Hmm. The moment you try to say, no, no, it's not doubt. I'm wondering if it's this or I'm wondering if it's that. Is it wholesome? Is it not? Like, that's doubt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so what you're doing, Bonte would call this, you're wriggling. W-R-I-G-G-L-I-N-G. -G -G -I okay, uh, what I'm was uh, when you get to deeper states, then I lost it again. Flew out of my head. Um, yeah, yeah. I can't do it when there's other sounds. I can't do it. <laughs> um, Nanda ji, please mute. I can't. Okay. Nanda ji, please mute. Audio mute. When when you are, when you get to um, the deeper state, there's nothing going on but that you're just watching. There is no verbalization. There is no sending anything to anywhere to anything or anybody. You're only, if you're coming into, if you, okay, if you're not able to just sit and fall into that state, work quiet mind, mm. you would start by sending to the directions just for one minute each way, just to get yourself going and then fall. It falls automatically in the mind. Okay, okay. Now, what, okay, I know what I was going to say. When you get into nothingness, neither perception or non-perception, and you're playing in quiet mind, mm. um, the thing about it is that, oh, geez. I don't know why that won't come out. Um, your mind, your mind is trying to trick you. <laughs> That's trick you on. The mind is My mind them. is trying to trick me, not to tell you. <laughs> Mm. That your mind is trying to trick you into mm. thinking something's wrong, something's wrong. I can't get to cessation. Something's wrong. That's what's going uh, on. That's what that's what actually going on. Yeah, your mind is playing trickster. Your mind is trickster. like. Do you remember I described the mind in this practice? I described the mind to you as being a two-year-old child that has been having an occupation working in your mind serving you for many years and now you want to understand all of a sudden in your life at this age you want to know how everything really works well your mind has been controlling your whole entire life the way mm -hmm. it was normally now you're saying i want i'm not firing you this is what we try to get the mind to understand i'm not firing you i'm not giving you a pink slip and saying you don't you're unemployed Actually, I'm telling you, you can sit in my head and just relax because I know what's going on now. I know how life is working. So now you don't have to work as hard. That's what you're actually wanting mind to understand. This is why I'm saying this is a communication thing that's going on with this meditation where we are learning how to communicate with our, our mind or our brain and let it know we're not going to put it out of business. It's got plenty to do with taking care of the organs in your body and everything else. And it's you're still going to be helping me and I'm going to be working with you now because now I understand how everything works. You see what's happening? But mind is afraid. It's like an employee who sees that the company is downsizing and is really scared it's going to be fired. So what does it do? Anything it can. <laughs> Anything it can so that you don't take over completely. 
because it's mm. afraid. So you have mm. to tell it before you fall asleep. I love you, mind. I respect you. I appreciate the brain. I, I appreciate my body and the brain for carrying me through life. I appreciate the brain. I love Ooh. my brain. See, I'm not, I'm not an enemy to you. I just want to understand how all of this works. And if you relax into that, all of this will stop. Thank you. Mm. Okay, that's what will happen. Okay. Okay, Let's thank see you. somebody else have a question. Yeah, good one, good one. It was very good. Anybody else? Perk up. <laughs> How is everybody doing? Nobody has a question. Come on, you got to give us at least one more question before I bounce into this thing. Okay. If anybody thinks of a question, I want you to just, okay, you have a question. That's great. Go. Well, it's, it's more, it's more um, uh, a reflection, uh, just going back on something we looked at a, a few weeks ago, which was the uh, lesser discourse on voidness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I really found the last two paragraphs really, <laughs> really good. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the idea of being of being void of hindrances, being void of uh, the things that are, are are emptying out, and yet there's still that um, uh, being present, still right. being yeah. So um, uh, so, and that's kind of just ties up with um, Sari Putta's um, uh, one by one as they occur. So it's still that awareness. Yeah. that presence uh, yeah. with the, the contact, the feeling, the, and all the rest of it. But there's um, no engagement. That's right. Yeah. Let me let's just read. Let me just read to them what we're talking about. The last in the last two paragraphs of this, it's the end of the uh, paragraph just before the last one. And what this is is the Buddha is explaining to um, Ananda what he means by a genuine undistorted pure descent into voidness supreme and unsurpassed he tells ananda he sits in that all the time ananda comes to him ananda says what do you mean by that and so the lord explains it step by step by step how you go what this voidness is according to him now this is important to all of us today because of nargajuna and the school of emptiness that came later on when they were trying to figure out what the buddha was teaching later on they they, they fell into this thing about the school of emptiness and attempting to get to total complete emptiness but the buddha comes out he's explaining it this way um the last one is um, he understands the field of perception is void of the taint of sensual desire. The field of perception is void of the taint of being. The field of perception is void of the taint of ignorance. This is present only in non-voidness. Namely, that connected with the six bases that are dependent on the body and conditioned by life. It just means your whole system is operating in your body and conditioned when it's working and when it's not by whether you're alive or dead. That's really what that means. Thus, he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus, this is present. So after everything is gone in the story, he started with the noise of the city, and then there was the noise of the town, and then there was the forest absent of the noise of the city and no more noise of the village. Then he sat down by the tree in the forest. He went in the first John, a second John, a third John, a fourth John, and as he was moving, he was void of the ones that he passed. And then he gets to the bottom, and basically he says, but even though I, you know, there is nothing, which is, um, a void of everything that was there before. So when you're practicing Sarma and everything's disappearing, as you're practicing, when you get into the deeper state, there's nothing there in it. when you're in quiet mind, you're just practicing and that's your void of anything until doubt comes up and now you're, you're into doubt, you see? <laughs> doubt <laughs> is present. So now you're into doubt. That's what happens to us, but it's your brain playing with you too. 
there's always something present. Now, there's something interesting about this, and I'm glad you brought this one up, okay, you, because in the, um, mm -hmm. Madhyamaka. Ma the Madhyamaka, the Madhyamaka group that happens before the y Yogacara group, and this is during the development of the um, Theravada and the Mahayanas, okay? And they're working with this emptiness thing and everything. And the, um, the Mag uh, right, Madhyamakas, that group, they have this really great perception of emptiness that I can really deal with very well. And what it has to do with is basically saying emptiness actually meant, the way the Buddha was teaching it, it actually meant I am empty of all the paramis and I'm empty of the fetters and I'm empty of everything. And that's the point of emptiness. Now, doesn't that make sense when you're moving towards cessation? You see? Yep. Because everything is let go, let go, let go, let go, let it go. And at the very end is Sarma jumping in with, you know, doubt pushing him saying, but wait a minute, but wait a minute. Okay, the brain is pushing you to say that. And you're saying, no, I want to be empty, empty of everything. So I'm letting go to see what happens if I'm empty of everything. So I find it fascinating that they were so... It was, I, I can't put my hands on that book right now. I had it on the desk, but I'm not sure where it is right now um, because I had it really, oh, wait a second, maybe I can. Um, the way they said it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. It's in the history part and, oh boy. Give me a minute. I wonder if I marked it. The point was, um, he was pointing you were empty. Of, think about it. By the time you get to quiet mind, think about it. You are empty of these hindrances, empty of those hindrances. You are empty of all, everything that was bothering you is empty, 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 empty. So this is what, I'm just going to keep going with the lesson plan. That would be a better thing for me to do. But the yad, if you look up yadmanika, yad, yadmanika, manika, yeah, yadmanika group, and their concept of emptiness, and you find a statement that they say, it's remarkable because it matches what our practice is talking about very well. It doesn't talk about empty, empty, and I'm glad because NASA figured out that space is not empty. <laughs> I was thrilled with that. There's no vacuum up there anymore. It's different. There's something there. And when I asked this guy at MIT that I know, what'd you find? He said, something intelligent. <laughs> and then we said, intelligent goo. <laughs> yeah. We don't know what it is. Something is there and it's intelligent, but it's not our concept or our definition of a vacuum for the space was all wrong. Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting. Okay. So what does that does that point to that what you pointed to in that sutta is really good. Did you have a question any further about it? Uh, no, but I also um, I, I was looking in the Dikna Nikaya. Um, I think it was number nine. And there they're talking about the uh, uh, Atapatilava, the acquired self, and they have the gross acquired self, which gets replaced by the mind made acquired self, which then gets placed by the perception uh, generated self. And each one, um, you move, as you, each one can only exist in isolation. The others have to be, as it were, void in the same sense. And as you move through them, and as you let go of them, um, it also describes how this is, is not something to be afraid of, um, because it's accompanied by joy and, and really attributes of the jhanas, the, the, the joy, the uh, tranquility, the um, uh, mindfulness. Um, and this. so that seemed to me like another aspect of this voidness. Uh, yeah. and, then, and then the perception acquired self is, is, is dropped away when you get to neither perception or non-perception. Oh, fantastic. Yes, yes. That's right. But, so so yeah, those sort of you know, all link together very nicely. What you just described also, interestingly enough, 
is causality. Causing yeah. a causality line once again. Do you remember mm. a couple of weeks ago we talked about looking at the different parts? And I think I may have mentioned to you guys, we might look a little bit more at the 37 requisites of enlightenment, see the different groups and just take a look and say, when we look the, put these down on a piece of paper, hey, are these causally related? Each one of those groups and the group to the group to the group, is it, is it causally related? And I'm finding causality in, in a structural sense is running through the teaching much, much more than I thought it was. Yeah, mm. and it gets real interesting when you can start to see it more clearly. Uh, okay, anybody else? Is that is that it? You, for mm -hmm. you, that's pretty good. I was a very good question, <laughs> really good. So, um, anybody else have an observation they want to share? Hmm? Okay. Um, I'm going to take you through something and a new chart that evolved, a new chart that um, is going to be toyed with here also. But the first part of this, I don't know if any, how many of you have um, ever done this yourselves on paper, but it's a lot of fun to do this. I have to find my pen. Um, and you think, well, I know some about Buddhism and I've been fooling around with these people who are teaching loving kindness in the Brahma Viharas and they're talking about tranquil wisdom, insight, meditation. But I wonder, I wonder, how much do I really understand? How much do I really know? Have you ever sat down and thought about how all of this hooks together um, and it, it's actually coming together in a kind of a weaving. That's I keep going back to weaving because I did weave for a while on a loom that was about a five foot, six foot loom. And um, it always reminds me of how this creates a pattern on the loom in the cloth and it's all interwoven. So I try to go back occasionally, I'll go back and I'll start looking like this and I will I will try to show you what happened when we did it this time. A friend of mine in New York and I, we did this and we tried to see what would happen if we, um, what would happen if we, uh, if we did this. Whoops, <laughs> now I'm getting it all upset. Okay, I don't wanna get you upset there. I'll keep you around. I just want as much space as I can possibly have. So um, when you start out with this whole thing, people say, well, what in the world is Buddhism about? And we tend to say, well, if you don't know anything about it, we start with the Four Noble Truths. And so I'm going to start there with the Four Noble Truths here. And I'm going to say, suffering. Then I'm going to go cause. Then I'm going to go cessation. And we all remember about the doctors, you know, person suffering. Let's take a look at it and see what the cause of it is. And then I know what the person looks like if they have no illness. So this is the cause. And so how can I get the person to be healthy? And that's the way to the cessation. Now, if you remember that, you can always remember it. And the next thing that happens is we, we, we understand from following the suttas so much that Siddhartha develops this um, these Four Noble Truths, he took them and he used them as an investigation path. And you may have heard me talk about this before, as an investigation path. And his path, the way that he was using this, he was looking at suffering, then looking at the cause of the suffering, 
and then trying to go back and say, if that was the cause, what is the cessation? That's how we figured out dependent origination, where we showed you in Samyutta Nikaya, he intellectually figured this out. So we know this was his intellectual path, intellectual path, and his actual path, his med meaning meditation path. Okay. And then he used his meditation observation tool. This is, so how do you figure out everything? He had to have a way to actually see it in order to become awake. So he tells us about how he used meditation. And he teaches his monks how to use it the same way he did as an observation tool. That becomes his microscope. And this microscope, at first, we think it's, well, it's, it's a good way to look inside. We don't think it's that great until we begin to see consciousnesses and in infinite consciousness. And then we think, oh, my gosh, he had an electron microscope way back then. He actually figured out how to have an electron microscope. So when we bring a person into TWIM, if you've ever been to a retreat with Bonte or me, you know that the first night, when you first come, we give you an orientation for the location where you are, and we teach you a set of basic things. And we're going to talk about it here first, but then we're going to keep, I'm going to give you the list of exactly what they are and why this stuff works when we teach it. The first thing we teach you about is the being. And we teach you the being is composed of five aggregates the body feeling, perception, thought, and consciousness. And then the next piece we show you is that body has six sense doors. And the next one, because you have those six sense doors, you can have contact happen in your experience in this life, in this existence. And when contact as comes as condition, feeling arises. And the feeling, there's three kinds. And we show you it's painful, pleasant, or neutral, but we tell you uh, three kinds, there you go, um, that you really can get all the way to Nibbana with pleasant or painful. You don't have to worry about this neutral thing or this neither pleasant nor painful feeling till you get way advanced and then you can start understanding it's not the same as neutral, but it's impossible to explain it to you in the beginning. And then what we show you, he, he talks to you about this feeling, the when the feeling arises, what happens then is, and this is like Dr. Poonaji talks about, that's where you actually create this part here. And you are creating what? You are creating I here. And what happens with feeling as condition? Craving, I crave, I crave. That's a bad crave. Let me do that again. I crave. And that means that I like or I dislike. But he's in total agreement with us when we talk about this happening this way, uh, because from this whole section back here, I, I always put it on the charts when I build the charts. I make this anything that has to do back here with the dependent origination, this is all green, having to do with the actual cognition happening 
that means it's part of your body and you personally don't have anything to do with making a feeling arise or making contact happen or making a sense door operate or um, the process of your con consciousness involved in the six sense doors and contact and perception is all part of the body. It's part of the body. So you're not, there's no I until it comes right here. This is where everything changes into a red one instead of a green one. And what craving as condition, clinging happens. And what clinging does is clinging to cling is like another gear, another more powerful, faster kind of craving. It's mental proliferation. If I like something, clinging is why do I like it? I like it because blah, blah, blah from the past. I liked it or I didn't like it and here's why and I remember. And so it's the story about why you like or dislike something. So once again, I am there. The next one is the habit, habitual tendency. And these, you know, we always keep changing this every year we try to say something else, but <laughs> habitual tendencies is what we started with. And Bawa is actually a library in your head of your personal reactions you've always done in the past. And you pull one up. And then what happens is the birth, what happens next is the birth of reaction, the birth of reaction happens all the time when you have an untrained mind. Once you have a trained mind, know more about what's coming, what's, what's happening in the process of your experience, you would start to have a response instead of a reaction. So we could say that there is a possibility of a response. That's what you're working towards. You're working towards changing these two, you know, getting rid of reaction and maybe become response. So this whole thing back here, the whole thing is actually, this is cognition that we're talking about. And we're only talking about the pieces in dependent origination that first night, you actually do hear about dependent origination, but you don't know it because we're not telling you that. We're just showing you how an experience happens. So what happened to the Buddha, when we go back to him, uh, he realized that he, he realized to change. Oh, he realized. <laughs> yeah, okay. He realized. That's the he is the Buddha. He realized um, to change. He had to have a system. He had to have some kind of a, he, he had to have a practice. And in his case, he had to change his practice. He began to understand it wasn't quite right. What he had done with Alara Kalama and Ramaputta didn't work, didn't go far enough. So he knows he has to change. And he's as he's going along, he's trying to figure out, he's, he's not always thinking about it, he's practicing. And he actually stumbles on it. And we think he actually stumbled on it the night that he woke up. That's what Bhante and I really think, you know, we've talked about it a number of times, but nobody really knows, but it could have been that fast because of what it was. And where is it? Majima Nikaya number 36. Uh, you go to that one and you go into section 30 and start reading there. The whole front part of that sutta is talking about the things that Buddha tried that did not work. And essentially that sutta is him speaking to, the, to this person explaining all the things he tried and it failed, so don't spend time on it, is basically the message until you get to this point. And at section 30, everything changed. 
So then you had to change. To, in, to change, he had to change his practice, his approach. There was something, something wasn't working. So the next part is um, he realizes that um, uh, when we're practicing, when we come back to us, you know, when we come back to us and we talk a little bit here, we say, you know, with us, um, with us, we know, we need to change from reaction to response. And the world would be entirely different if we did that. So when he's looking and he's watching what's happening inside and everything, um, he has, he realizes that he has blockages. He realizes there's blockages. We have to go back here. He realized there are blockages. And blockages during observation blockages during observation cause unusual internal movement of mind's attention and the, the movement is going to the hindrances. And you can call these distractions. There's a lot of names for these in the sutta. We can call them hindrances, um, disturbances, distractions, blockages, obstacles, and obstructions. There's like 11 or 12 different words we can find on that. Then what happens when this is going on usually is observation stops. Observation stops. And so he called these, I'm just going to put an H, these hindrances, he called them imperfections. And that's the one I, I like the best because it's not accusative in any way. He called these distractions imperfections. And as he studied them more closely, as he watched, and that's what you are. You're being trained to be a watcher. And as he watched, yeah. craving occurred. Craving occurred when the I is invented. Every single time. The 
this is where he began to see Atta in a totally, and he, he noticed it's in, I is invented to personally. like or dislike. Like or dislike. And move forward faster. So it starts with a feeling and the feeling's painful and I don't like it. And then I don't like it because and then you have this energy happening here with habitual tendencies really fast. It's like jumping in and grabbing a card out of the card file and then giving birth to the reaction. That's what's happening to us. So the question that arose this week was how do we reach the right condition? Okay. So I don't know. You should probably need to take a picture of this because I have to go to another board. <laughs> So somebody has to tell me you took pictures. Does everybody take a picture of this? You have it? I can go, I can go to another board? Yes, somebody say yes. Yeah? I took a picture, I'll share with the group. Okay, so can I, can I erase this one? Yeah? How do I erase, right? How do you do that? Oh, I can't remember how you get rid of the whole thing. How do you do that? <laughs> this is funny. Oh, clear, there it is, clear. Here it goes. So we're gonna clear this. Now we're gonna keep going. Okay, this, this um, the question now that we're working with here is how, whoops, how do you make the eraser right? <laughs> okay. How do, I'm gonna get this guy to go up here. How do, how do we reach The right condition, there was one line I didn't write, right condition. And this is key right here. I'll tell you why in a minute. How do we reach the right condition to fall into cessation? Okay, so this is like a track I'm taking you on. Okay. And this goes on like this. And, and then come to um, I'm sorry, then come out, come out. To experience. Anybody has a question about that, they need to ask me when I come back to you guys, to Nibbana. How do we reach the right condition to fall into cessation and come out to experience Nibbana? Now, see, I'm going to put a stick a note in here that every level of understanding you pass through you reach a condition fall into the next to the next so how do we reach the right condition to fall into cessation people ask this all the time and come out to experience Nibbana, because we're showing you how that works. 
And when I come back, if anybody hasn't seen that before, I'll draw it for you really quick. So this has something to do, yep, this has something, he knew this, something to do with how he began to practice, which was um, with the practice of right effort. With the practice of right effort, uh, right mindfulness. Now remember what we say about mindfulness in our training. We don't say mindfulness is paying attention to something, but um, the mindfulness is our, our observation power. It's our observation skill, we can say skill, because it's very particular, the, this skill. Um, and has something to do with the practice of right effort, right mindfulness, our observation skill. And this is productive, I'm gonna say it this way, productive, uh, collectedness or concentration, whichever word you want. But the key word, the key giveaway here is productive collectedness or concentration. Okay. And um, so it, it comes back, comes back, comes back. to the six R's, okay? And you keep six R'ing until you are in quiet mind. Now, all of the problems that you have on the way to the depth of quiet mind, which is basically gonna happen in nothingness and neither perception or non-perception. All of the problems that you're gonna have have to do with what I was discussing with Sarma about his mind. Mind is trying to play trickster and trying to stop you from getting there when you get to the deeper, it can be very quiet, you know, when it's in infinite space, you might notice, or it can be very quiet in um, infinite consciousness because there's something for you to discover, something for you to watch and experience, and you're into that, and, and it's curious too, and it's just there, but it's not, it's not trying to trick you at all. But when you get into nothingness, then where it really starts getting <laughs> where it really starts getting trickster is where like halfway through nothingness you've been frustrated because why because there's nothing there and every place else you've been through this practice there's always been something else you know but there's nothing there one person got stuck there for 5 years Another person was stuck there for three years until they finally got it, that there's, you're supposed to be exploring this place called, that no one's ever been to it before, and it's called nothing land. And you're supposed to come back and tell us, what is nothing? <laughs> this is frustrating, but that, but you're just supposed to observe. And if you can relax into that and just watch, no matter what, just keep watching. The rest of this is going to keep happening because, frankly, when you got into first jhana, that's when you op you sort of fell in the river and or in this, near falling like falling in the stream sort of. But this you're falling into river inside of you. Something is moving forward, even if you stop practicing for a month or two and come back after you've been in the jhanas a couple times. You're going to feel that you're starting further ahead than when you left. 
And you're going to wonder, why is that happening? Well, it's because something has opened up inside you and wants you to keep moving in that direction. And this is all very natural. It's all part of who we are. So you briefly, the important part is when you're in quiet mind, it gives you a chance to discover something and, and really confirm in your mind with, so there's no doubt in Sarma, this is what you should, you should try to do and relax in your practice as you're relaxing. Where you, the steps of right effort are to, um, you know, to recognize that there's a change in tension. And then I like to say, just never mind it, never mind. And when you say never mind, you let go and then you relax. And right here, right here, before you smile, as you come back. What is that pink thing right there? What is that? This right here, it's not bad color, isn't it really? Let's make it yellow. What is that? It's quite, it, it, is, it is pure mind. That is still point. We call it still point or pure mind. And the, when you can, when you can see this, when you when you ha notice it, and you don't really get to sit and watch it or anything like that, it's just really quick. But when once you realize there's a tiny spot here, it's it's how big is it? Well, it's this big, maybe the size of a tip of a pin. That's pure mind. But if you are very quiet and you have been letting everything go and you're very still, when you look between that relaxed step and, and the smile, just kind of watch. There's nothing there because when you relaxed, you let go of all the craving and there's nothing starting again until the smile starts over here and the observation again. So there's a space that is pure mind. And when that still point happens, that is your confirmation that the state of cessation is real. And when the Buddha figured out that was real, this watching, this is where he probably just really let go to see what else was going to happen. And then, boom, and this kind of thing, this kind of state, it doesn't happen in a lot of practices where there's any concentration that is causing any tension in the brain at all. This is one of the reasons like when you let go, you should always remember letting go is not relaxing. These are two steps. This is one and this is the other one. And the second one takes apart and drops out the residual leftover tension that didn't happen when you just let go and let it fall away. There's a tiny bit left in your head and that's what the relaxed step is about. Okay, until you are um, using quiet mind and you briefly experience the still point, you realize clear mind, so you return, you relax, you smile and you come back. Now, um, so this is how you're preparing the practice of the uh, release, you know, you know, the letting go, relax, smile, and come back. Recognize, let go, relax, smile, come back. That's the principal guts of the practice. And then just saying, repeat this, keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it, is encouraging you to not pay attention to anything, anywhere, anyhow, just nothing. And just keep doing that. It will take you through to cessation and you'll fall in cessation. Okay. Now, uh, let me see what I want to show you. All right. What time is it? 7.48. Okay. I can do this by eight o'clock, I'm sure. Okay. So, that's, I'm going to actually give you the training pattern. I'm going to give you the chart now. Okay.
Okay, so I'm going to erase this. So you take a picture of this one, okay? Take a picture of this one, Dama Givesi. Okay. Wait. <laughs> yeah, I'm waiting. Okay, you tell me when. Done. Now we're going to show you a new chart. I'm going to show you a new chart. And this is fun so far, but you have to let me know if it's clear or not. Okay, that's what you guys are for. You say you pretend there's a clock. And this is the clock. And on this clock, there's a 12 and there's a three and a six and a nine. Okay, now what we're trying to demonstrate is all the stuff we're talking about and the place where you're attempting to go to into cessation has to do with the six. So what we ended up putting on the six was this is where, where cessation is going to happen. So I put cessation like this. The arrows are pointing in. This is cessation where everything shuts down, turns off. And how does it happen? What is the preparation, the, the, the condition that has to happen for that? This is where the strongest equanimity is developed. And you are experiencing not pushing in either direction. So let's look at what these other directions were for a minute. Over here was unwholesome. Mind states. And that had tension. And aversion. And there was reaction happening here. And this was a, a pushing where you're pushing away. And over here in the other side, I mean, there was a wholesome and there was less tension instead of aversion there was attachment and you could call this a reaction also but it was a pulling, a pulling two, a pulling to the three. And actually what this ends up being is like, oh, it's operating kind of like a pendulum because this piece is hanging down like this and it wants to land on the six, which would be, it would mean that Sarma gets to the point where he has the perfect conditions to fall into 
um, cessation. This is where the perfect conditions are so you could fall into it when the strong equanimity is here. And I maybe could take this, this is where you fall into it. You have to have the strongest equanimity. And then we ha I had to create the seven enlightenment factors because they all have to be completely aligned. And so I'm gonna make them purple, okay? So here underneath, whoops, I ended up with blue and I don't know why there. I want blue, I want purple. And, and this is like, um, you know, this book. <laughs> You're paying attention to it, right? Investigation. Energy. Joy. Tranquility. collectedness, wisdom. Oh, this is equanimity, isn't it? Equanimity. Right, Pekka, okay. Now, what's happening with this um, all these pieces are in here. This is like a book of the seven enlightenment factors. Oh, I didn't leave enough bottom at the bottom, did I? <laughs> I'm gonna run out of space. I'll have to do it on the right side. Okay. And what's going on over here is an automatic, automatic mindfulness. And Sarma, that's when you don't have anything to do with thinking anything of a questioning anything anymore. And your mind is just paying attention to watching and that's all. Okay. It's your automatic mindfulness. That's what this is. Okay. And this is all perfectly lined up. And what happens when that happens is there's a space below that isn't there. So underneath this box, I have to show you, I'm gonna to have to show you on the right side, but actually <laughs> I, I messed up my diagram. <laughs> that's funny. Okay. So that's where this cessation happens, the cessation. And everything, it, it's imploding. Now, of course, it's the total contraction in cessation. There's your cessation. Then when cessation happens, actually this one, has to do with, well, what is cessation? It, cessation actually is, there's no perception, feeling or consciousness briefly. No, cessation, feeling, or consciously inside here. There's not, not, not a nothing, okay? And then after the cessation, um, okay, what else, the other point to remember about this is there is a, when cessation occurs, the brain goes, um, there's it's a blank past future and there's just present on pause but these two 
past and future have essentially been wiped. And then I don't want the problem with talking about this is this is not a brain wipe, okay? It's different. A brain wipe wipes out who the person is with all their memories. They don't have any identity when they come back. It's all like that, okay? This is not a brain wipe. So I try to come up with another. There is just a blank on the past and a blank on the future. So when, when you come out of this, this is cessation. And when you come out of this, so maybe we should go up here to make you come out of it. This is what happens here. Okay. And then what happens when all of this is happening, there's no perception, feeling, or consciousness in the cessation. When you turn back on, okay, well, we should do this better. Wait a minute. We have to show the little dewdrops, don't we? Okay. This is like when this is coming back on. Okay. There are these little drops that happen. We'll make them little gold colored ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And what happens up there is I'm going to make it like, huh? When am I going to make it? We'll make it cool. and we'll make it to explode this way. And this is Nibbana. And Nibbana, what it is, is you, it, you turn back on. Remember I said there's no perception, feeling, consciousness. You turn back on and as you turn back on, this right here is cognition coming back on. That's what that line is, the 12 links. They come back on. And when this first happens to you, you can't barely see this. You might see dew drops, you might see little pin lights. But when you've done it a number of times, okay, then it gets more and more clear that these are coming back on. But at the first time, you're kind of shocked at what's happening and you don't know what's happening, but you're coming back on, you're turning back on. So it's like coming out of like if you were in an accident and you had a tree on top of you like I did and I was going out of consciousness into con out of consciousness and into conscious unconsciousness back and forth. You can tell when you're coming out and going in, falling in and coming out and falling in and coming out. Only if you know what you're looking for, you'll see something that comes back on. And this the nibbana itself what is it, the question that started this whole development of this whole drawing of this thing, you know, what is this? This is Nibbana. This is Nibbana. But what is it showing you? What is actually happening is your brain is turning back on. But we have experiences that we go through with changes in the way that our sense bases are operating and we wanted to explain i wanted to try to have a way of explaining to you what is happening the reason that you're having that kind of those kinds of changes occurring with your sense organs is because there is no perception feeling consciousness here and there's a complete shutdown okay and when it shuts down when you initially come through Nibbana and come out the other side, you really are present time debased. You're, you're present time. So now when this happens, and this is present time, when you come back, present time, and it's very clean, very, very clean. Now, over here in this drawing, this is actually it's swinging like a pendulum and you start out you drift towards unwholesome doubt and you swing back your intention is to come back here and keep practicing but it usually swings over here some and it keeps swinging and if you allow pendulum to just swing long enough 
eventually it will come down to the six. And that's what's happening to you. This is what's happening at the six. Everything, this is becoming totally balanced. There's no managing it anymore. It's automatically, the automatic mindfulness going on with balanced investigation, energy, joy, tranquility, collectedness, and equanimity. And you're able to just watch. And when this, the, the shutdown, when this gets all balanced, this piece here gets completely balanced. That is basically where there is a, um, everything just goes dark and everything just stops right here. And that's when you're falling into, that's when this is happening. You're falling into this and then it comes out. So how fast does this happen? Hmm. <laughs> I think most of us would agree that if it happened the first time it happens, that this happens like in a, almost a split second, it's, it's a few seconds that it's happening and you're not sure what's happening unless you've had enough education as to what this is about and how it's operating. But what I'm showing you jibes pretty well with research in what's happening. And, and seeing what's happening. The only place there's a few questions is that in the text themselves, they say per perception and feeling ceases, okay? But the first time that happens, consciousness is really gone. And it seems the only place I can relate to anything like this happening in my entire life is when I was going unconscious and coming out and coming out. And, and going in and coming out and going in and coming out. It's the only thing I can compare this to, I can point to in my whole life, except for what happened afterwards was completely different, completely different. But remember when that happened, I had no, no real education about this yet. It happened in um, 2000 and 2001 on the first mountain where we were located. Okay, and 2002 was the first time anything like this happened to me. And I couldn't understand, I was always questioning, all these years questioning, well, what is it that happens to us here in this level, in, the, in this level here is what is so fascinating is when this happens, and then you come out, okay? When you're coming back into present time, your, your sense doors, that's what is so interesting. What is happening to your sense doors? And how does it happen that, 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 that's, that that's like that? And the answer to it is that you've been cut off from the past and the future briefly. You're totally clean. That was one of the conditions for falling into this whole thing. Yeah, that's, that's what we look at and say that must be what this was. So I'm gonna come back to you all now. You wanna take a picture of this? I messed it up just a minute ago. I don't know how to undo that. I took uh, one minute ago. Oh, good. You, told me. <laughs> you were good, you caught it, okay. So I'm just gonna come back over here now. So this is what I'm trying to show you, you know, now, I also had questions about us saying different things about attainments. And I had questions about um, talking about Sotapanna, Sotapanna fruition, Sakadagami, Sakadagami fruition, the way that we see it. And this is just the way that we see it. Nobody knows what was really happening 2,600 years ago. But what we see happening is that what I just tried to explain to you happens once for somebody, twice for another person, three or four times for another person, but not in the same retreat. Usually it's over periods of time and not everybody can go so many times. So I'm wondering where is this in the text that it's indicating this? And I'm interested in it because a lot of people will say, oh, Nibbana, there's only one Nibbana and that's it. But the texts disagree and I still can't find it. I'm still, I was reading and I got into a story with the Buddha one night 
and it's one of those deals where I didn't put it on the three by five card and save it to tell you where it is. But in the text, there's a story of a monk. And at the end of the story in the sutta, um, I don't remember who it was, whether it was Sariputra or whether it was the Buddha, mentions. And so this was his first experience in of Nibbana. And when it says this was his first experience of Nibbana, I mean, light bulbs went off in my head <laughs> because that's the way we're looking at this. And we're saying also that when this happens, after you've done it, after you've managed to get through and have it happen one time, then what happens for the person is if they want it to happen again, it's not going to happen. So let it, let go of that, you know, um, because the rule, this is, this goes back to the laws of meditation that we made a list of laws that we knew were absolutes. And one of the absolute laws of meditation is if you want something to happen in meditation, it will not happen. If you want it, you can't have it. It's frustrating. It's like a child's game. If you want it, you cannot have it. And so this whole thing, the way I described it to you just now in trying to explain to you what it happened in this whole thing with him. And, and for us, we can still experience this the same way. There are no doors that are closed here. These attainments are still reachable. So there's a lot going on today with stories you hear. The worst one I ever heard was that don't bother meditating because it could take you 1,000 years to reach Sotapanna. And that's awfully frustrating because <laughs> you would have to be born at least three or four more times. You, in the time of a Buddha, somehow in the universe. And remember, you were meditating before and keep going. <laughs> it's very complicated, isn't it? So that doesn't make any sense. And this was something that started over in Sri Lanka with some young monks who wanted to tell people not to bother with meditation. I was so surprised when I ran into this with a family I was counseling. But anyway, um, then there are other people who will say that it could only happen in the time of the Buddha. They'll say stuff like that. There's nothing that indicates that at all, nothing in the text. I've talked to many scholars that know all of the texts in their head from Burma and, and been exposed to them. And um, there's nothing there that says that. So in Satipatthana, when they're teaching you Satipatthana, they're only teaching you in terms of anagami and arhat also. This is it's very interesting. So there's different kinds of uh, experiences that happen when you go down, use different kinds of meditation. But one thing that we can say, we, we had this statement of there are 40 different kinds of meditation the Buddha talks about in the, in the um, I can't remember what the statement was, I'm trying to think of it, but we, we think there's, there can be 40 different kinds. It can be, we counted 52 different kinds of meditation and practices in the text. Somebody, usually it's 40 something and we counted 52 twice. Okay. But there's only one path. There's only one Nibbana, how it works and only one way for the right conditions to arise to get there. So this is not saying that what we're teaching you is the only meditation where you could use the six R's. You, if you're breathing, doing breathing meditation, you can use the six R's. It just moves slower. When we deal with students who try to keep that going in life all the time, they don't use it in all types of emotional situations as a remedy to come out of it. But if you're using the Brahma Viharas, it's very different because you can fall into your loving kind. You can fall into your forgiveness for the person in front of you who's getting you upset. You can give them compassion by giving them enough space to be upset if they're yelling at you or putting you down or criticizing you because maybe they're having a bad time in life too. 
you can go right to that and say, this is compassion. I can listen to you do this and be quiet and let them do whatever they want to say. This is words. They're not, you're not going to die from having words said to you, no matter how bad they are, if you understand that. And then loving kindness, sending loving kindness back to them. So one of the things we looked for was a, um, this is where I'll close up with this. Um, one of the things we were looking for was how to end a retreat. And if you've been to our retreats at the end, you hear us go to 21. And this is the Kakachupama Sutta. And you always hear us end with this. Why, why do we do that? Because we're talking about what you should be doing when somebody is putting you down and yelling at you or being crude or something else towards you. Our minds should, this is what the Buddha is telling you, how you should be practicing in life, how you should be using your meditation all the time in life. Okay. Our minds will remain unaffected. We shall utter no evil words. We shall abide compassionate for the person's welfare with a mind of loving kindness without inner hate back at them, you see. We shall abide pervading that person with a mind imbued with loving kindness. And starting with him, you use the person who is being abusive, starting with him. We shall abide pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility, without any ill will. That is how you should train. That is what the Buddha is telling the monks. He is, he is reciting to them what he expects as a measurable outcome of practicing the way that he was practicing. That's what this is all about, you see? So that's no matter what happens, you have that that you can use no matter what is being put in front of you. And even though bandits were to sever, this is the story, sever you savagely limb from limb with a two-handled saw, he who gives rise to a mind of hate towards that person would not be carrying out my teaching. Our minds should remain unaffected. And then he says the whole thing again. You should use whatever is happening against you as the first post on the race to send loving kindness to every living being in the universe. Doesn't matter what's happening. So I hope that you enjoyed this adventure. Does anybody have any questions about it? Um, next time I will show you uh, in a small chart exactly what we're teaching that is the foundation information that a person needs to learn and keep repeating and keep repeating until you know by heart that information. There's actually six pieces and two support pieces for the six pieces that we train you in 10 days when you come to our retreat or when you work online with us, either way. And once you have that information, then you understand what's going on. See, today, one of the things that happens, I made a note when we were, we, we, there were four of us working on this together. And today, the purpose of observation is largely gone in, in um, the kind of observation we're talking about. It's gone from, from a lot of the meditation training. Because many people in this lifetime, they just come to meditate to become calmer and calmer than the conventional reality they're living in. And when I first came to all of this, that's why I came. I was um, completely a mess, completely emotionally a broken person, totally exhausted and wiped out after two years of really struggling through multiple deaths in the family and people fighting over estates and everything. I wanted nothing to do with anything anymore. I was totally wiped out. But 
the idea arises that we can escape life temporarily by feeling calm. And so we come to meditate. And one temple I was staying at, the one man who was running the library, he was not a monk, he was a lay person, said to me, don't, this meditation the Buddha taught is just to calm you down. So the whole message of what I just explained to you was lost. In that particular temple was not interested either in helping people to learn meditation or use it as a central a central thing to do, but there was another place in the same city that was dedicated completely to the training of meditation and actually going for what we're talking about. So the ultimate goal was lost in this case to just come to sit down to be calm. In my case, however, when I came and sat the first few times, I went home and slept like a baby where I was staying, just like a baby. But Nibbana is seen mostly um, as an ancient form of relief that people have lost touch with and they don't understand what it is. So, and as I was saying a minute ago, you may have heard me say there's more than one Nibbana. There's a set of mundane Nibbanas and there is a super mundane Nibbana. And that is definitely in the text and turns up and that's what the whole story of the main objective is to reach that one. But it was originally this series of experiences with a, a, a attainment and then the fruition of it to seal it. And then another attainment and another fruition to seal that. And another attainment and another fruition to seal that. And then arahat and arahat and fruition. So we hear about these things, but we don't put it all together very well a lot of times. It was training to reach a total emptying of mind of any analysis, any time of anything, Sarma. <laughs> See, no more analysis, even. I, I'm being, something's going on. I was wondering, yeah, I am there still. And wondering is the verb <laughs> and doubting. So we come back to that. And the body had the full attention of the functions of the brain to heal, support, and keep strong, healthy, and fit. And this attainment of Nibbana going through cessation that way, taking away the pressure of the past, the pressure of the future completely was like a newborn brain coming out of it. And then that's why the senses were changing. That's what we we talked about at the end. So next time I will show you how the training evolved with um, TWIM so that you can see it fell into a line across about a four, maybe five year period. It fell very well into alignment with what we just described and explained and gave you all the pieces, but short definitions and just what you needed. So you don't have to take an Abhidhamma course to do this, okay? But I'm not against Abhidhamma either. I wanna tell you, I think it's, it's fun. Um, if you have your practice fully developed to then go and look at this Abhidhamma and you see, oh, there wasn't just two or three feelings. Wow, there was 128 of them, <laughs> you know, and they just have a lot of names, but basically it's talking about the same thing. So any questions from anybody right now? Yes, yeah, Sarma. Uh, Mandami Mataji. Uh, Archana here. Uh, actually, whenever I, uh, most of the time my meditation is good, uh, but uh, there is a concern about you, uh, my daughter. She is in class 10 and it's an important year for her to achieve. And uh, I feel she's not listening to me. Uh, she should study. Uh, somehow I'm really, uh, uh, really messed up, confused. How should I deal with my daughter? Uh, so that is my state of mind. I feel disturbed when I think about her, how she'll make her future, the study. Uh, and then uh, I, I lose the whatever uh, peace I achieved through meditation. I'm sorry, this is out of track session, but uh, I really need the uh, solution for this. Hmm. I mean, what, how I should, uh, what should be my behavior? How, how old, how, first of all, how old is your daughter? She's, uh, she'll be 15 years now. 
Last tenth. Fifteen. She's fifteen. Okay. Yes, yes. When you're meditating, that's what you have to be doing. Nothing else. Okay. And what okay. you're doing, what you're doing is. I'm going to go back in here a second and make this guy disappear. What you're doing is you are here and you're sitting and you're meditating. Well, I'm going to do it, this, do it the old way. Let's do it the old way. Okay. Whoops. You're sitting here and you're meditating. And you're working with whatever your object, your object um, of meditation, your object of meditation, and your brain, your brain is still producing thoughts, you see, and your thoughts, it's okay, no matter what it produces, while you're practicing, you let your brain produce thoughts, there's nothing in the Dhamma that says we're supposed to stop your brain from producing thoughts. Then all of a sudden, a thought of your daughter comes up. There it is. <laughs> you know, I had five kids, so I can sympathize. <laughs> okay. I had five kids in the house for about seven years or seven or eight years. Anyway, here, what happened is now you're thinking about this thought. That's where your, your observation is going. The moment that you feel yourself pulled over to your daughter, you're not going to help your daughter while you're in meditation. You're not going to come up with ideas to solve things with your daughter during meditation. The best thing for you to do is to de develop your meditation so your mind is very stable and very strong and you can look at things. Uh, and the problem, the problem parents face with kids growing up today there's so much distraction, so much distraction mm -hmm. everywhere, okay? Yes. So I don't know how you're operating your house, but uh, restrictions on the digital thing, they need, there needs to be restrictions on the amount of, of computer time, the amount of digital phones and everything going on when you're going through high school, you know, if you're going to get good grades. But... Right. The thing is, it's not at, at 15, she's determining her life. You know, she's, she's already starting to determine her direction in her mind and her life. And I don't know how you run your house. I'm not sure. Okay. But when you're pulled over to think about your daughter here, then you're not doing your daughter any good and you're not doing your practice any good. Okay. And when you're okay. practicing your and developing your meditation, you should be coming out clearer in your mind when something is going on. And you can practice with your daughter by using the Four Noble Truths. And if there's an issue between you and your daughter in the house, you can each take a piece of paper fold it in half like this. This is the first noble truth. And you say, you know, you take your paper and she takes hers. This is the second noble truth. And on the other side, here's the other side. This is the third one. You use the four noble truths as a peaceful reconciliation so that you can work to be together better in the house. And the thing is, when you want her to do something, well, for instance, if you want her to do something, you play the magic manager game, you know, you give her three compliments and then you ask her to, to change one thing every time you speak to her. That's number one. What's happening now is she's getting older, you know, and and she doesn't want to be bossed around, right? And if you want to help to help the situation first you have to be a listener and you have to get her to understand that you're what you want to have happen is for the, her best interest 
but she needs to understand that you're going to work together with her. And if you haven't established it already at 15, it's going to be a little rough, but you have to be patient. Okay. And setting up this kind of thing where you take the paper and you, you fold these, these papers on the first side, you write what you think the challenge is. The challenge is the suffering. Okay. This is what I'm showing you. The challenge that's what do I think the suffering in the household is? What does she think the suffering in the household is? That not suffering, but the challenge to getting along, okay? What is the difficulty? And you don't, don't criticize, just criticize each other like it's all mom's fault and, and, and you say, well, it's all her fault. No, really talk about what you think the challenge is. You write down that here, and then she writes it down on her piece of paper. The second noble truth is the cause. What do you think the cause of this happening, the cause of this is in, in this household? Now, if she's pretty bright, she's going to write down, you know, well, because I'm going through a tough time and I'm a teenager now, and 15 is hard, Thir you know, from 13 to 16 about is really hard, okay, because... Like they don't have permission to do a lot of stuff yet, you know, and they want mm -hmm. to be, they want everybody to think they're ready to do this, that, and the other, but they don't, they're not really ready, you know, but working it this way, you put the challenge down, then you put what you think the cause is, then you put what you think the solution is, okay? Are there mm -hmm. any other children in the house or is she an only child? Sorry? Is there, is she an only child? She's just one child or? Okay, uh, she's, she's elder one and the younger one is uh, uh, 10 years. Okay, so there's another one, 10 years. Well, the one, the one who's 10 years can actually sit at the table and do this with you too. Anybody? Yeah, she, uh, yeah, yeah yes. yes, write, what yes they think, write what they think they can write, but it's private. You know, it's each, each person writes down what they think the challenge is in the house. And then what do they think the cause of the friction? You know, like when we don't get along, why? Usually at mm -hmm. 15, it's because I want to go with my friends and because mom wants me to clean my room. <laughs> right, right. Perfect. Okay. And you want, I'll give you a situation in Florida. The mom came to me. She says, I don't know what to do. Here's what happened. And she said, the daughter was sitting right beside her and she explained it. And she's saying, yep, that's what happened. Okay. <laughs> and so what she explained was she was planning to go to the mall with her friends to buy a pair of shoes. And her mother, they had, she had set up the thing and her mother came and said, I need you to clean your room before you leave because your grandmother's coming over for tea. And she didn't want to do that. She wanted to go with her friends. And so there was this big thing. And so what we, we figured out was this was unreasonable for mom and it was unreasonable for her, but she, it was like, you had to compromise, compromise. So how about this? Mm -hmm. If you spend five minutes to help mom clean the living room and the kitchen, and she spends five minutes to help you clean up your room, and then you go to the mall, and then she can have tea with the grandmother and the house looks okay. And, and she said, oh, yeah, it's not a bad idea. So you work together. You're all in this together. If you're in a family, you're in this together. And then mm -hmm. beyond this, you're in the community together, you see? So you work together in a community, like, for instance, sometimes you go in India, you have a clean neighborhood, and sometimes you have a really dirty neighborhood, and nobody wants to be the one that's going to go out and clean up the mess. Yeah, but nobody's asking you to go out and clean up the whole mess. If everybody cleaned up the mess right in front of their house, they'd have a clean neighborhood, right? Okay. Right. This is like cooperation, and cooperation, what you have to do is be be letting her know this is it's not like do this this is for your own good that doesn't work okay but you know um and she's a little old for the one where the younger even the younger one is a little bit old but when they're really small you can say uh i need you to go to bed now now you can go up and go straight to bed or you can have five minutes of a story and go to bed or you can play with me on the floor for five minutes and then go to bed. But by golly, you're going to get this one to go to bed. <laughs> so she gets to choose which way she's going to go to bed, but she's going to go to bed because you want them to go to bed. Do you see what I just did? I, I didn't take <laughs> yeah. power away from the children. I made them yeah. choose 
which way they wanted to go to bed, but I wanted everybody in bed in five minutes. See? Yes. <laughs> Tricky thing. Yes. Okay, this way you're letting her see you, she is, you are willing to listen to what is going on in this house. You can do this with, I have houses where I'm counseling people where the whole family decided because of COVID and it's a big family, they were all gonna come to the biggest house and all stay together, crazy. And these are aunts and uncles trying to live together and you know they don't think the same way or run their house the same way, but they're trying to do this. And now they have an idea where everybody is looking at what is important. What, was, what does each person think the challenge in the house is? And what does each person think the cause is? And what does each person think the best solution would be? And then when the two kids write their stuff down, if dad is willing to do this, he should do it too. And then you guys take the papers and this is how you do it. You come back and you, you write down what you think the best solution is. Here's the solution the parents write down. And if you really want this to work, each person has to see part of this solution is their idea. You understand what I'm saying? Right, right, yes. Every, what they were trying to contribute as a solution, part of it has to be in your solution. And then you say, okay, this is what we're gonna try. And we're gonna try it for a week or two. Let's everybody try this way. And everybody agrees to it. Now, how should we try it? And this is where you come out and you, you, um, you come out and you say, okay, we're gonna try it, but when we try it, we are going to do it according to the eightfold path. And they go, oh boy, what are they talking about now? <laughs> you know, and then you put the eightfold path here, you put the eightfold path and uh, you end up that they have to abide by this eightfold path and they have to keep their precepts. Okay, that's what they have to do. It's not, it's no big deal, right? First of all, they have to have an impersonal perspective not be selfish, okay? They have to think of other people in the house. So this is an impersonal, impersonal, um, impersonal uh, perspective or view, a perspective. So they don't just think of themselves. They live in a house with four people. They have to think of everybody when yeah. they decide to do something, right? The second one, yeah. so have perspective the second one is image they have to have a, a harmonious let's use the word harmonious harmony is okay. where everything works together the right way so you have a harmonious um hmm. images an image harmonious thoughts in your mind you don't think bad things about people you don't think ugly things or dangerous things you think harmo you keep harmonious images in your mind right so that's perspective right. in your image. The next one is communication, communication. That means mm -hmm. you don't go around yelling at your, your sister or your brother with your arm on your hip saying, I don't care, I wanna do it this way. You don't do that, mm -hmm. okay? So mm -hmm. it's harmonious communication is considerate of everything. It's kind speech and kind movement of the body and don't kick the other person or go, well, do, 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 do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, you'd be fun. Mm -hmm. okay, then, yeah, harmony, let's see, first I pick them. Okay, the one, uh, this one is movement of mind's attention. Where should your attention be all the time when you're doing anything in life? On what you're doing in the present time. Don't be thinking about the past or thinking about where you have to be in 20 minutes. Just be here now, get the task done and then go. And you have to be considerate when they have a schedule, they have to be considerate when you have a schedule. Yeah, it's respecting right. each other. It's lovingly respecting each other. Okay, but it's, and it's, it's taking care of each other. This is lifestyle. The lifestyle is everybody tries to keep the house clean and it keeps it pretty neat, you know, so that people are comfortable when they come home from work. You keep your stuff in your room or under your bed in a box or a trunk, or whatever, okay? Yeah. And then, um, 
So this is your practice. And when we're talking about this practice, we're talking about right effort. We use it all the time. And I call it the never mind game. Okay, this is a never mind game. So when you feel like you want to get mad at me next time, you stop for a minute, close your eyes and just laugh at yourself because it grabbed you. You want to get mad at mom and you just say, never mind. And you let go, okay. relax, you smile and you come back. You got it? You never mind. Okay. You let go. Relax. Smile. And come back. And you be and then you be kind, you be kind in everything you do to the people, to the dog, to the bird, to everybody. Practice. Okay, then this one is observation. Observation. Are you observing? This is your observation is mindfulness. Observing how you're dealing with one thing at a time. Are, are her grades okay at school? Yeah, yeah, yes, she's in class 10 in school. Okay. And now it's uh, online teaching. But are her grades okay with what she's doing? Yeah. Okay. Uh, she's in class 10 and the study is study and study. I, we are behind her. She should study. That is the only motto currently. Be very careful. She doesn't study too much and not play at all. Be very careful of this because you're asked you too much time on the computer and then she ends up with headaches. Is she sleeping? How many hours yeah. a night is she sleeping? Yeah, she's she's sleeping eight hours. She play for three hours. That's what we are worried. She's in class 10 and she's not giving much time for study. So that's the fight uh, arguments happen over there. Is this playing games or something online? Uh, no, no. She go out for playing badminton or uh, some uh, uh, running uh, with her friends. She's having a group of friends so much attached uh, with her friends. She just want to be with them or even uh, at home also she want to be online chatting with them. So that's how uh, so much of attention to friends and not to study. So we are worried for that. But I'm going her, to follow the eight steps you all said. Her grade, if her grades are up, then she's keeping her end of the bargain, but she has to be helping at home too and her environment and her community. It's not just about totally going out with friends. There has to be, right. as a family, deciding how everybody has chores. I mean, my, my littlest one had her own apron and her own little tools to help me in the kitchen and clean the house and everything else when I was when she was really little you know she had her own had to have oh. her own room and her own mop and everything so she could do everything <laughs> and then she had to help oh, nice. me help me in the garden and everything so from you know like eight years old and up they should have a set of chores when they come home from school they yes. put some time into the house and then I don't nice. know how, uh, yeah. I don't know when it's really good she, she do practice, she's into, she's listening to Dhamma and she's like, we keep on sharing so many stories and about uh, Buddha and she's so, so much into things. I mean, she, she follow the way, I mean, I, I, I really appreciate her help. But the elder one is, uh, uh, don't feel that, uh, I, I'm feeling really worried about her future, how she will be doing. I think she's not uh, taking any responsibility about her study. Nine, class nine, she did well, but 10th now her grades have come down. And uh, well, then is if important. If her grades are down, then she needs, this needs to be pointed out to her. And just, you know, this is what you're doing. This is your job right now. This is like what yes, I, yes. my nieces and nephews was like, this is, this is your job right now until you go to work. School is your job to, to be pulling for the family, you know, and for yes. everything. Okay, lifestyle practice observation um, and uh, concentration. All right, so this is collectedness. The last one is collectedness. You don't want her to concentrate um, too hard. If she gets her work done, then she can do some things. But I think maybe one thing you can do is look up the situation of spending too much time online on the internet. Find if she's 15, she's old enough to read some articles about what's happening with people. And it's like, we're, tr we're being tricked. We're being taken away from humanity, from each other, from working with people. And instead we're being pulled into working with digital stuff. 
and on the internet with our friends all the time. This is not, it's not healthy, you see? Right, right. But she has right. to see for herself what they're finding and reading if she'll do it. Is she interested in science? Sorry? Is she interested in science, in psychology? That till now, it's not clear, actually. If she focuses, she does everything in all the subjects. But that is also not clear. We were talking today. Today, we had PTM also. The teacher was worried about her marks. Uh, that till now, sometimes she does extremely good. Otherwise, uh, her focus is not there. Uh, can I ask her to do some meditation? I mean, which meditation she, she should go about? So I can make her sit with me. So I have to make that. You, uh, actually. you can't get her to do loving kindness. And whenever you guys have a spiff, like any kind of argument or anything, be sure that you do forgiveness with each other. And you're sending loving kindness, but you need to be working with the development of loving kindness. Mm. Right. The thing is, if she's spending time on the internet and stuff to, well, it all depends. You know, if you want to sit down and do some breathing meditation just to calm down, that's one thing. But I would rather see her learn to do loving kindness and compassion where she can put that into the family in the relationships with everybody in the household. It works better. That's just my experience with people, you know? Yes, I'll, I'll do that. But, you I'll know, do. I can tell her the story about the, I wish I had a bunch of teenagers I could teach because I have some neat stories about staying in the present time and working in the present time. So you give full attention to what you're doing just in the present time. And then the next present time is when you're on the phone with someone. The next present time is something else. But you have to do your schoolwork first because that's your job, just the way dad has to go and do his job. Or if you're working, you have to go and do your job. They have to look at their schoolwork and understand that in this, especially in the thing with COVID going on, that's their job and their contribution to the community and to the house and everything, to the family. It's just the way I look at it. This is my, my thing. That is, that is a very important point. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there one more question? Anybody have a question about what we talked about? If you want to think about it for next time, uh, we can do that. And I will see you next time. Okay. So we say our prayer. Yes. May suffering yes. one be suffering free and the fear struck be. May the grieving shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings have space and earth, space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, 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 sadhu